Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture in this benighted age, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes or by plugging our RSS feed into your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on Spotify, YouTube, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod to make a one-time or recurring donation and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. Well, the uh, tendrils of a tropical storm are set to roll through here, so rather than bore you with my doings... um, Let's just jump into this week's show. Uh, my guest this time is Margot Mifflin, who's got a new book out today, uh, which is August 4th, 2020, for you time travelers in the audience. It's called Looking for Miss America, a pageant's 100-year quest to define womanhood. It's published by Counterpoint, and it's a delight. Margot told me this was what she was working on when I met her almost two years ago. I was recording with her husband, Mark Derry, about his Edward Gorey bio, and Margot and I made general plans to record a show about her her new book, because in 2018, you could make plans about things that would happen in 2020. Luckily, this did manage to come off. So looking for America, or looking for Miss America is a really impressive book. In about 250 pages plus notes and and photos, Margot manages to explore the history of the Miss America pageant or competition, uh, as it's now called, and its its key winners and the deeper and conflicted messaging about femininity, as well as race and class in America that it, it represents. And, and she shows how it tried to keep up with the times while also trying to maintain a conservative or, or traditional idea of womanhood and, and how conflicted all of this was. Um, it really, you know, it, it gets into like how the, the pageant declined under a variety of, of cultural and, and technological forces that that we can see mirrored in so many other forms nowadays. And it's, um, gosh, it's a really compelling book uh, in terms of how illuminating it is about this weird, uniquely American phenomenon and what it actually, um, what it tried to say, what it uh, inadvertently accomplished and the reactions to it over the, the well, over the century that it's been around. Uh, I was just totally swept up by this book. I read it in a day, uh, like I say, about 250 pages. And as we mentioned during the conversation, this was not a topic I had any prior interest in. Um, she managed to to take this material and create a really compelling narrative out of it, get some really deep thoughts uh, about well about womanhood in America in the middle of it and um and that's why I give Margot a ten in the writing talent portion of the competition. I know they it, Miss America doesn't actually use a one through ten scoring system, but it was either that or a, a joke about how badly I do in the the swimsuit competition. So anyway, go read Looking for Miss America, a pageant's 100-year quest to define womanhood. It's out today. It's from Counterpoint. Should be in all good bookstores or online. Now, as caveats go, Margot's mic was a little metallic sounding, but, eh, you know, we'll deal. She was actually the first guest since the pandemic hit, who I thought I could conceivably record with in person because she lives somewhat close, not in a city. Potentially, we could have recorded outside, but we'd have had to put up like a plexiglass shield and and sat at 90 degree angles to each other and wear masks. And, and we each still would have worried that we were going to basically get COVID from the other one. So... It was another remote podcast session. Uh, I don't foresee any circumstance where I'll be able to record in person for a very long time. Now, here's Margot's short bio from Looking for Miss America. There's more at her website. 
the author of Bodies of Subversion, A Secret History of Women in Tattoo, and The Blue Tattoo, The Life of Olive Oatman, Margot Mifflin has written for publications including The New York Times and The New Yorker. Her new book is Looking for Miss America. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Margot Mifflin. Where did the book begin for you? And as a side question, what was your history with Miss America and pageants in general? Mm -hmm. Well, where it began was I was just browsing around on TV and stumbled on Miss America about maybe five or six years ago. And I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It, women in swimsuits, women doing ventriloquism. Uh, and it just seemed like an, an ama amazing relic of another era that I wasn't aware. I must have been generally aware that it existed, but I hadn't seen it for a long time. So I started to think about what, why it still existed, who still participated, uh, but more significantly, why nobody had explored the cultural history of this ritual that had been in existence for almost a hundred years. And so uh, started thinking about uh, also what, what it was actually, because there's talent, there's an education component, um, there's the swimsuits and piecing them all together in a sort of coherent concept was difficult. So uh, I began to research it and my research led me to a better understanding of what it was and it brought me to the conclusion that it's actually never been just one thing. It's evolved through history and it's not one thing now. It's, it's this kind of pastiche of a whole bunch of different things. Are those things irreconcilable? I think it's pretty difficult to reconcile them. It's easier now that in 2018, the swimsuit was removed. So in that year, Miss America was moving towards um, something more genuinely empowering, to use the word that they use for women, um, because of the scholarships, which have benefited many women, <clears throat> and and the sort of pr professional training that it gives women. Um, so I'm I'm not sure. I mean, the next year will be its 100th anniversary, and they're uh, planning on celebrating that and having having a pageant. They don't call it a pageant anymore. They call it a competition. Uh, so I think it'll reach its 100th birthday, but it's not clear what exactly it will be in the future, since many of the pieces that it that you know defined it in the past, namely the swimsuit, are gone. Yeah. And that's what I wondered. When I talk about reconcilability or ask that question, it's if you remove that component, does it, you know, is it no longer Miss America? Is is And I know they only had a one year sample set for this one to, to figure out where the whole competition is going. But mm -hmm. um, it did seem reading the book, just it seemed as though there are so many warring impulses Mm -hmm. or, or ways of trying to interpret it that you know I found it fascinating and it's such a, a brief book about 250 pages for the main the main body um, to see such a an interesting cultural phenomenon that becomes so difficult to, to unravel from from American trends over the past century in fact I'm putting words in your mouth tell me how this this you know what what does Miss America reflect about who we are who we were and and how we live well, it really def reflects dominant ideas about ideal womanhood through through the decades, and and just for context, it's it's evolved from the twenties when it was strictly a swimsuit competition to the mid thirties when talent was added because the uh, director at that time, who was a woman, wanted it to be more than just a swimsuit contest and wanted it to give women something that would uh, benefit them in a long term way and, you know, possibly push them into professions. Uh, and then in the 90s, the, or in 1990, the platform component was added where women adopted platforms, social is issues platforms that they um, uh, advocated for, literacy, um, cancer awareness, uh, domestic abuse. 
And so it evolved, you know, pretty considerably over the course of, of that century. And, uh, and yet in, in each decade, it's reflected different ideas about women, womanhood. Some of those changes uh, were directly correlative to women's status at the time. For example, uh, in the 40s, there was a really pronounced kind of patriotism to the pageant because in the course of the Second World War, uh, you know, women were working during the war. And after the war, there was greater awareness of women's role in the workplace. So that uh, sort of amplified the importance of giving something giving women women something more than um, money for competing. So the the um, scholarships were important then. I think I think I may have said they started in the 30s. It was 45 when the scholarships were added. It was in the 30s when Talon was added. Uh, so e each era reflects, you know, in the 20s it was it was really about uh, rewarding women who were girlish and compliant at a time when women were making great strides. They had just won the vote in 1920. So you could say that the pageant was a direct reaction to that and, um, you know, a, a reactionary reaction uh, mm -hmm. in the, and, and so the body types even were, were very girlish and trim and slim at that time. Then in the thirties, the body types became curvier, um, and in um, the 40s, the public presentation of the women was more about, uh, more assertive and, you know, in the service of patriotism. They were going, the women were going out and selling war bonds in that period. And then in the 50s and 60s, that's the interesting transitional point and what many consider the golden era of Miss America. In the 50s, the pageant was uh, very much sort of what, you know, older generations remember it as being glamorous and um, really uh, sort of high profile and having a big national impact. But then in the late 60s, there's a feminist backlash against it that came with the women's movement of that era. And in fact, the feminist protest of 1968 of the pageant um, was the point at which second wave feminism sort of unleashed the word women's liberation into our vocabulary and, or into our lexicon, the sort of the public vernacular, because the women who protested it first uh, standing outside on the boardwalk with um, signs and then inside by unfurling a banner that said women's liberation, um, that was the moment when when that word kind of hit the media and hit national con uh, consciousness. So just to finish that long sentence and and to answer your question, those periods reflected the status of women, um, and then that continues on into today, where where the the pageant has really tried to catch up with feminism since the '60s and always has been about you know a step behind it. Um, but I think in, in 2018, when they got rid of the swimsuit, they, they really were starting to become something more relevant to women today. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, reflection could almost be, you know, an actual reflection, the inverse of, of what was actually happening with women. Right. So, yeah. So there's sort of this, this uh, push pull, there's the, the, pageant in some eras is resisting feminist progress as when it started. And in other eras, it's responding to it and trying to catch up to it. Um, and I'd say like maybe in the seventies, it was most successful at catching up because that was when they permitted starting in the late sixties. And then in the seventies, the women were then permitted to express their personal views. Previously, they had been told don't talk about the war, don't talk about your politics, just, you know, smile and be nice and accommodating. And then with the, with the close of the sixties, I guess they realized we can't really suppress them this way. They need, if we're saying they're, they're uh, empowered by this, we have to let them speak. Hmm. And do you have any childhood recollections of this, of, of the, the pageant at all? It's funny. I was just talking to one of my sisters about 
what we watched on TV when we were kids. And there were a number of shows we all watched. I, we were five siblings, uh, but Miss America was not one of them. And yet I think everybody my age, I'm almost 60, I think almost everybody my age had a real awareness of Miss America and who was Miss America at that time, you know, the 60s, maybe into the 70s. Um, and certainly a memory of Burt Parks, who, funny <laughs> enough, is the one, the, you know, he's probably more famous than any Miss America in the, in, you know, in the historical memory of this institution. So I didn't watch and I was probably, I didn't really have a uh, strong awareness of it as a kid. And then in the 80s, when it started to lose consciousness and when I, I mean, when it started to lose um, sort of relevance and uh cultural cachet, I sort of had contempt for it, basically. I just thought, why would anybody do this? And o only in researching it for this book did I really under start to understand why people not only did, but continue to do it today. Yeah, what surprised you, I guess, in terms of researching and, and writing the book? I was surprised that the... Uh, well, just certain facts surprised me. Number one, that there's never been a Latino winner. There's been, there was a woman who won who was born in Paraguay, a white woman, but never a, a, a Latina of Hispanic heritage from, you know, born mm -hmm. in the U.S. And that surprised me because, you know, it's a hundred years and surely it's not a coincidence that, that this is the case. Um, I was also surprised that the scholarships are funded, 85% of the money that uh, goes to scholarships for the women comes from women themselves. In other words, they, to, to compete, they need to raise money and donate that to a charitable uh, organization through the pageant. And the money they donate in, in you know, raising money to compete funds 85% of the scholarship. So it becomes a little like um, a lottery. And or one, a pyramid scheme. <laughs> yeah, you, you could call it that. One former Miss America, Kate Schindel, who wrote a really smart book, uh, Analysis of Miss America, herself called it pay to play. Mm -hmm. So that surprised me. Uh, and so the, those were the two those were the two things that really stood out to me in, in researching it. But I was also surprised just to learn how far back it went and how much varied history it has and, and, and also just how many really interesting characters participated in it, including some very rebellious ones, which I didn't expect to find. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What was the, uh, especially of the early ones? I, I think one of the interesting things about the book to me is showing the, the difficulty of managing celebrity, even, you know, a hundred years ago when there wasn't a Kardashian thing, mm -hmm. um, the way you have the the one woman who decides to run off with a chaperone rather than get her crown because she didn't sign up for all this or, or you know, so she decided. Um, and the way the various early contestants, especially, you know, find a great tension just in trying to deal with, you know, that sudden sudden wave of attention they were getting. Yeah, that woman, Betty Cooper, she was so interesting. She won in 1937, and she was someone who was sort of pushed into competing. I think it was by friends who just thought it would be interesting for her or fun and didn't really want to win and then won and couldn't believe it and regretted it and then took off with her handsome chaperone who had, um, you know, sort of piloted her around during the course of the, the week that she was competing. And what she said was simply, I, I'm a, you know, she was in high school she said, and, I, and a lot of the, the early winners were very young. The first winner was only 16. She said, I just want to finish high school. And I, I loved that she added that she also didn't think she should give that up and give up her girlfriends because she would have to go into a vaudeville career. A lot of the early women, once they won, they were offered uh, either film contracts or 
pressured to go into vaudeville, whether they really had talent or not. And that was sort of demoralizing for some of them. But I also discovered just recently that that same year, there was a woman, I forget where she was from. They didn't really have state winners yet then. They were mostly regional winners in the in the 30s. But that same year, 1937, there was a woman who didn't know she was going to have to appear in a swimsuit and said, sorry, not doing that, and quit. And so she foretold one of the major rebels of the pageant history, Yolande Bette Bees, who in 1950 competed. She was from Alabama, and she's on the cover of the book. She's a, she's a great, very charismatic, interesting yeah. Miss America. And she competed, won, and then was told the next day by the sponsors that she would have to pose in a swimsuit during her year. And she said, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to do that. And she had not signed the contract that would require her to do that. So she completely sidestepped that painful aspect of the pageant, painful for some women. I mean, a number of women I read about said it was really a sort of trauma, either read about or interviewed, said the swimsuit portion was was traumatizing. Others liked it and, and felt pride in doing it. And some today really would like to still be, you know, wish that it were still a part of the pageant. But but Bees was historically significant because, she, A, because she was smart and a very talented opera singer and uh, also a really witty person. I, I, I couldn't even fit all her great quips in the book. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, for example, she said one day, uh, she said, you know, sometimes I think Miss America is another person and I wonder what she'll do next. And she's also the one, I quote her in the introduction, who said, Miss America is the type of person who goes into a bar and loudly orders an orange juice. So she, <laughs> <laughs> she had a good sort of sense of irony about the pageant. But she also, it, it, you know, she only died a few years ago. She, at the end of her life, was still um, affectionate about the pageant. She She won, then she sort of turned on it in the 60s and 70s and called it racist and sexist because... It had never, because black women were for a long time prohibited from competing. And so she was very politically aware and politically engaged. And then in the 80s, when it got more inclusive, she went back and supported the pageant um, and attended with, with other former Miss Americas. So she was quite rebellious. And when she ref refused to wear the swimsuit, the executive director, Lenora Slaughter, um, sort of turned that around to we don't we don't allow our winners to wear the swimsuit on their tour year anymore and phrased it as if it was her own achievement not, not bet bees's rebellion yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah she comes off as a very interesting figure too uh slaughter the one thing i will say about yolanda that i loved was that it allowed you to bring philip roth into the book which oh, i won't yeah. spoil for anyone who hasn't read it yet but oh my god it, it was just amazing to largely because this episode's coming on right after Benjamin Taylor's episode, um, who did his memoir just now about his 20 plus year friendship with Roth. So I was glad to sort of have that oh. continuity from episode to episode. But yeah, seeing, you know, and just, so, just so your listeners know the the connection and I won't give away the full story, but the connection is that uh, Philip Roth's uh, book uh Gosh, I'm, I want to call it American Pastoral, and I'm blanking on the name yeah. suddenly. American oh, that's Pastoral. it. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. The first one was American the... Pastoral, and that was the name of the trilogy. So, okay, yeah. great. Thank you. Uh, features a, a, a state Miss America winner who was not based on Bette Bees, but he interviewed her to get insight into how to shape that character and the, and the realities of the pageant. Yeah. And it's it's an entertaining segment of the book. Having him show up earlier as as uh, pre Portnoy Roth um, covering one of the the pageants was also well. Uh, I thought that was oh. all the Roth I was going to get, so I was so happy he showed up later on in the book too. Yeah, and that's a great a, a great uh, scene where he's uh, reporting on the pageant. I think it was for the New Republic and talking about the talent and how the women sang smiling and read poetry smiling and played the violin smiling <laughs> at this whole routine <laughs> 
Yeah, for you, what was the the toughest part of research for this? Outside of, you know, some things are a century old, so it's tougher, but what was most difficult? Yeah, that's a good question. What was difficult? Uh, Initially, what was difficult was just getting access because the the pageant was not, uh, you know, wouldn't, basically wouldn't help me at the beginning. They were, they were not hostile, but they said, we don't, you know, we don't endorse books. And so we can't really do anything for you. So that meant going, it, what I thought would be a lot easier, and historically for me as a journalist has been a lot easier, contacting an organization and getting the, the contact information you need for the people you want to interview. I had to go in a in a roundabout way, directly contacting winners and then securing interviews and then having them introduce me to other people. And it was, you know, the people I interviewed were, were very helpful and um, very, uh, you know, had great wisdom to impart about their experiences. And each person I interviewed, I felt gave me a different angle on the the pageant and, you know, not necessarily consonant with each other. Some of them thought those swimsuits should remain because a lot of the time that I was doing my interviews was when the pageant was really in crisis, it had it had uh, the swimsuit had just been removed. Gretchen Carlson, a former Miss America, had become the um, board chair, and there was a kind of rebellion uh, within the competition because that year's Miss America, Cara Mund, claimed that Gretchen Carlson bullied her while she was Miss mm-hmm. America. So there was a, a big split or controversy in the pageant culture that year. And uh, it it was uh, it it was just a, a very difficult time in terms of the reckoning of you know how it was going to move forward or not. And not all the women I interviewed agreed on whether the decisions had been made were good or not. <clears throat> Everybody mm-hmm. seemed to really come down in a different place on that. While you don't editorialize about it within the book, I'll put you on the spot now. What would you keep? What would you? How would you change the pageant if you could, or the competition if you, if you could? I would keep the scholarships because that seems to be the real, concrete value of all this. It has the one area of Miss America that I think is really underexplored is class. That uh, there's you know it's a it has benefited lower economic and and middle income women who might not have been able to go to college if not for these scholarships. And some of the money is really significant. Um, mm-hmm. So the, the scholarships matter. Uh, I'm, I'm not so sure the talent really matters because on one hand, Miss America was the kind of original American reality TV show, the elim- you know, elimination competition. Yeah. And, and yet, there's so many other competitions now that that people can compete in that that Miss America isn't really the jumping off place it, it was 50 years ago. So mm-hmm. the scholarships really matter, and yet I'm not sure anybody wants to watch a scholarship competition. I mean, I'm a professor, and I only want to watch <laughs> yeah. a scholarship competition if my my own stu- students are involved. You know, I can't imagine just tuning mm. into somebody else's randomly. Yeah, yeah. So I guess that's what I'm, I'm getting at. How do you how do you change it, but actually make it something something that's you know uh, that'll draw an audience, um, even given our our weird fragmented age. Yeah, I think it's going to continue to be very hard to draw an audience. I mean. The the demographics of it are are so far down. I mean, just to to dramatize, in the late '60s there were something like 70 million, between 70 and 80 million viewers, and in 2018 there were a little over four million. So part of that is about, as you said, you know, the viewer demographics being chopped up into smaller and smaller pieces um, because of all you know the sort of fragmentation of the media. Um, but some of it is just about whether people want to watch women compete each o- against each other in this contest, in this context. But, and some of that is just about making women compete against each other. In this day and age, 
the idea that you have this segregated competition and women jump through all these hoops for an opportunity, it doesn't make a lot of sense, especially when men don't have to jump through these hoops to get these opportunities. Either for did you have the whatever. Oh, Sorry, yeah. go ahead. You, I said, did you have the the fairy princess thing growing up? You mean in in as sort of part of my family culture, yeah. or that, or was I into that kind of thing? You, you yourself, yeah. Uh, was, well, was it I was something a, you, I was yeah. a big Barbie fan. It wasn't so mm -hmm. much um, fairy princess. I probably had a little bit of that, and and I also remember my own daughter, who's twenty four, having a big fairy princess phase, and and sort of stopping her and thinking, you know, do I want to encourage this? Um, but it was as much about fashion and like expressing femininity for her, uh, or, or I'd say it was more about that than any real expectation that somebody was going to come and anoint or save her in that princess way. Um, so yeah, I, and it's, you know, it's amazing. There's still, Today, there's still pageantry that I think is related to Miss America that uses that language. Like there's uh, something, I'm just looking to see if I can quickly call it up. It's like a, 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 it's called a Cinderella pageant or the word Cinderella is in it. And it's, yeah. I think, a teen pageant that either up until recently or still does feed into Miss America. There's another one called a sweetheart pageant. So this whole idea of the the princess, the Cinderella, um, getting crowned, uh, is, is active in pageantry today, which surprises me. And it's especially odd in Miss America, because if it's a pageant that represents America and American values, and the central symbol is a crown, when there's nothing <laughs> less American than a crown, the symbolism is, is, off and has been for a long time. Funny enough, at the start, it wasn't uh, it wasn't a, a, that kind of a crown. It was a Lady Liberty kind of a crown. It was this strange long headpiece that looked very homemade that the first winner wore, and then it evolved into this sort of middle Middle Ages type crown um, with studs on it, and then. Soon after, it became closer to the traditional crown we see today, the four-point crown that, that kind of gelled in the 50s for it. And like we said at the beginning, there are irreconcilable slash contradictory elements of this that you know, it, it's that you, you pull something out, it's like Jenga, you know, the, the thing falls apart, but it wasn't exactly stable to, to begin with. Mm -hmm. Before you, you started the project, could you name a Miss America besides Vanessa Williams? Oh, good question. I'm trying to think. I probably knew about Lee Merriweather, the actor. That was the one my wife came up with. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was the only other one. Lee Merriweather. Um, and then Phyllis George, I did know about because my sister was a pioneering sports reporter and as F Phyllis George was. And so mm. uh, that name had come up. I'm trying to think. Did you ask like when I was a teen or just in my life? No, no, just you know when you started the book. Were oh, you okay. Able to think of anyone besides Vanessa Williams, who's always the first one who comes to mind for. Yeah, and the other one yeah. is Gretchen Carlson because she had yeah. been on Fox and Friends at that time, and that was before she brought down Roger Ailes with her sexual harassment lawsuit at, at Fox. Yeah. So she was. Uh, I mean, she was when I started the book preceded when she did that, but she was still a well-known Miss America. Right. And the only other one I had was Bess Meyerson, and that's A, Jewish, B, um, because Sucrete Gable was one of Howard Stern's wacky guests in the 80s um, oh, on, on yeah. radio, and that led to the whole Bess mess scandal. But, yeah, and that's yeah. That, that's a good one, too. I did know of her because, you know, from living in New York during that scandal, it was front page news all the time. So Bess Meyerson would most certainly have been one. Yeah, I try and explain to my wife some of the weirder aspects of, of New York in the 80s. Mm -hmm. She's from elsewhere. And it's just, there are things that, that went down beyond, you know, the AIDS crisis and everything else. There's just such weird aspects of, of living in or around New York in that era that don't really make sense when you look back on them. things like this uh, with, with Bess Meyerson. Yeah. But, um, 
yeah, Donald Manis. Well, there, there's all sorts of stuff. That's a rabbit hole I could I could fall down into. But um, during the the process of working on this and and explaining it to people and and you know starting some interviews, how often did you have to say not the Trump pageant, the other one? You know, oh, how often did people mistake? You know? It it must have been at least 90% of the time. So many people said, oh, the timing's so good because they, most people think that Trump either owned it or owns it. And he, right. he never owned it. The only thing, he owned Miss USA is the, the area of confusion. And so I think part of that is just pageantry confusion. People think that they don't know the difference between Miss USA and Miss America, <clears throat> but they are different. Miss USA doesn't have scholarships and Trump had nothing to do with Miss America, except that he, he judged, I think once yeah. or maybe a couple of times uh, long ago, but he most certainly never owned it. And yeah. I think that he was uh, foremost in people's mind when the subject of pageants came up because he had harassed Miss America contestants. I think they were teen Miss America contestants or not, I guess harassed would be the word in the sense of walking in on them in the dressing room while they were preparing. Yeah. That that's, that's harassment in, in my book. Exactly. Uh, if not yes. something creepier, but, but yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, did you have to do uh or did you do uh many Atlantic city visits? During I this, went, as well, part I of the went research, to, it was the 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 one big one was in 2018 for the pageant. Yeah. That was the year the swimsuit suit was removed, and hmm. it was. And I also went to the Miss New York. They were very different. Those two, the 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 Miss America in Atlantic City in 2018 was really a, a fascinating experience, both because of what was happening that year in the pageant. Um, with a lot of the division and transition, but also just it's it's really different to see it from the audience. It was not a great year. the The huge venue where it's held, Boardwalk Hall, was probably less than half full, and the talent had changed. There was a woman who did a, a Harvard educated. I think she was studying to be a neurobiologist and. It recited a poem that on one hand I thought, well, why not do something more like a TED talk that reflects what you want to be? Because historically so many of these women have been asked to, to do a talent that doesn't have any bearing on what they're trying to achieve in life. Yeah. And so she did this poem that I thought was sort of charming and genuine and very different from the classical piano and the opera and the other kinds of standard Miss America performances. So I start clapping heartily for this this woman when her poem is finished, thinking she's really a lot like one of my students. I could really relate to this. And there was just a stony silence around me. And it was clear that <laughs> nobody sitting near me thought this was remotely acceptable for a, a Miss America performance. And she did not win. Yeah. Uh, but it was also interesting in terms of Atlantic City itself, because I hadn't realized I'd been there as a kid. I grew up, at, well, actually in Swarthmore. We will talk about that later because I'm sure I know you have a Swarthmore connection. I, I lived there for a year and lived around there for another four years. But but yeah. Go on. Oh, OK. Yeah. So uh, I grew up in Swarthmore. And when I was 17 in the late 70s, cut school with my boyfriend when the uh, casinos were opening. So we mm -hmm. went and looked around, checked out Atlantic City. And, and, and I'd been there as a little kid once or twice when I was about 10 for, you know, to go to the beach with my family. And when I went to the pageant in 2018, it was just shockingly depressed and, and sad. And I just wasn't prepared. Another journalist had called me to get a quote for an article she was writing and 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 she said she was scared like that she there were certain streets she didn't want to turn down to go back to her hotel because of the um just the the, the state yeah. of that city uh, which was really sad because one of the fun parts of the research was researching atlantic city in the 20s and 30s when it started and that it was this fabulous very inclusive, economically diverse 
resort town with everything in it, very loud. Um, you know, people of different economic classes came. It was good for kids. It was good for, you know, uh, couples and families. And, and, and it was really a phenomenon. There was tons of, you know, there was theater, the show, theater uh, productions premiered there and then went to New York, famous performers. And it's sad to think that all that's gone. And I don't think it's going to be coming back. No, and that's what I, you know, it's early on, one of the things I wondered with the book, how much the decline of Atlantic City, you know, um, paralleled what happened to Miss America. But it seemed like Miss America at least had a few more um, rises or golden eras uh, within it, where Atlantic City sort of, even after you introduced casinos, things were headed downhill for quite a while. Yeah, it was up and down. And I think that it, I think people still did come for the pageant, you know, long after Atlantic City started to decline. Then it skipped over. It was in Las Vegas for a few years and then it went back to Atlantic City. And that year that I'm talking about, 2018, was the last time it was in Atlantic City. Last year, it was held in December in a casino in Connecticut. So it really lost that, that uh, you know, a, a, an important part of its history and the venue that had defined it early on. Can you talk a little, oh, one of the things I, I was really interested in was the, well, in, in concert with the notion of people trying to game the pageant system where, where, you know, people started figuring out what to focus on and, you know, sort of pursuing it professionally the sense of engineering to replicate gender roles and performance, mm, you know, how that, do you that, mean? well, that, that sense of, Oh, this is how I have to behave to seem like this feminine ideal, you know, oh, identifying that reverse engineering it. And, and then of course you, you mentioned at one point that everybody admits that drag performers are doing it better than, than a lot of these women were but um, right. but yeah, that sense of uh, i know that goes beyond the scope of the book somewhat but i'm pretty sure you're going to have thoughts about that you know what it means to um to engineer that that notion of femininity and and you know execute that yeah it's it's interesting it, it really uh segues with simone de beauvoir's ideas of um you know gender being socially determined uh it, there's it, it, the pageant has historically been so socially, so conformist in terms of gender. So, you know, a, a real reinforcement of binary notions of gender identity. And so much of the self-presentation there is about that, is, is about being feminine in a, in a very traditional sense, being compliant, being pleasing, there was uh, one Miss America I interviewed, Elizabeth Ward, talked about how she felt it really warped her, that she she had to go to therapy to undo a lot of this uh, gender conditioning and sort of body consciousness that she found to be damaging to her. And one piece of that was also the what she called the people-pleasing people aspect of it, that you learn, I mean, on the upside, the women are trained professionally to become effective speakers and have a professional self-presentation. But she talked about how that was also about pleasing people and making everybody around you comfortable at your own expense. And it took her a long time to sort of deprogram herself from that. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, just what you'd think in terms of a beauty pageant, gender conformity. Um, although more so in Miss America, uh, like Miss USA has had a trans uh, contestant, which mm -hmm. Miss America has not. And so for whatever reason, I guess because of its traditional underpinnings and its uh, attachment to patriotism and, uh, and perhaps a antiquated idea of patriotism, Miss America remains more socially conservative than some other pageants do. Besides Simone de Beauvoir, what other philosophers slash cultural observers sort of helped to ground you for this particular book? 
you know, mm. who did you find yourself sort of leaning on along those well, lines? You know, there were two books that were models for me. Uh, one, one is Jill Lepore's A Secret History of Wonder Woman, because mm. it was such an effective telling of the story of the history of Wonder Woman couched in the history of each era as it developed and uh, sort of took root as something of interest in our country. And then the other one was M.G. Lord's uh, book about Barbie. Um, I always want to call it a real doll. I'm looking at it on my bookshelf and it's not <laughs> called that. It's called Barbie Forever. A, a real doll is a, a short story. Um, and so that also was a, a really wonderful examination of, of Barbie and what how Barbie came to be and what Barbie told us about ourselves and our own visions of womanhood. So those were useful, not just because of the history and cult cultural context that they explored their topics in, but also because they were na narrative driven. The, there were excellent stories in there that propelled the history itself. What reading the memoirs? It seems like you you went pretty deep. Uh, it seems like you read a ton of memoirs of of former winners or other significant uh, uh, contestants. Common elements among those books were there things you, you you noticed cropping up again and again that were not you know what you were expecting along those lines. Well, it's funny. I'm looking at them on my bookshelf right now. There's probably fifteen or twenty of them, and. It actually takes me back to one of your uh, previous questions, was about which was about the training to be a woman. There are a couple here that were about how to be in a beauty contest, and uh, basically say, "Here's how to be a woman." Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking for the, there was one in particular that was great and you, funny. You cite that wonderful portion about like walking, uh, you know, how to walk in the bathing suit, how to sit down, you know, what, what hand to put where and, and everything that I was just, as a man, horrified. <laughs> <I know>. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine like having to, to do all this, you know, consider how you're going to approach the chair, how you're going to lower yourself into the chair, where you're going to, how your legs are going to be uh, yeah. positioned, what to do with your hands, don't move your hands, don't use use your hands as yeah. you speak, keep them folded on your lap. I mean, you just, you can't even imagine it. But And, and that, what you're referring to was from the 80s. That was a guide. I think it was mm -hmm. written by a former contestant, though, that uh, explained all that. But the one that I was thinking of was by Jackie Mercer, who was, I think, 49. And so... For example, you know, it's called uh, how to be, I think it's called how to be a beauty queen or how to win a beauty contest. Yeah, how to win a beauty contest. And so she talks about how, for example, you have to just practice all the time You and recommends smiling at lampposts. So you get into the <laughs> habit of just having your smile ready all the time, turn it on as at any opportunity you can, which is really interesting now because there was a uh, initiative, you know, it's sort of in keeping with the, uh, that, you know, with feminist opposition to catcalling, uh, calling out people who tell women on the street to smile. So uh, yeah. it was called Stop Telling Women to Smile. And um, the woman who started it just initiated this campaign because it had been happening to her and so many women she knew. And yet Miss America is all about smiling and accommodating. And the, the smiling piece of it, some people have interpreted compulsive smiling as a deferential gesture. So, you know, I never really found good document got documentation of this that uh, really made a scientific case for this. But there's some argument that people in positions of power simply don't smile as much as people who are disempowered. Hmm. So I fall in between I'm disempowered and I'm dour all the time, but you know, <laughs> it works for me. So it's okay. <laughs> there you go. But yeah, the memoirs, I mean, you, you asked were there, was there any commonality? Um, there was a number of them really 
just talk a lot about, I mean, they're, they're, they're memoirs about becoming Miss America. And so it's about how did I train? What did I buy? What was it like? Oh my God, I couldn't believe it. I didn't expect it. But, you know, the reaction to getting picked. A couple of them uh, talk about the difficulty of having done this whole year of service and, and how it grates on you that you're always, you know, the, the historically this, the schedules have been really punishing. The women are traveling 20,000 miles a year going, you know, in a different, to a different city each day. I'm not sure how, how much that continues because I don't think Miss Americas are in demand as much as they were even 20 or 30 years ago. But two of the women in their uh, memoirs talk about feeling actually suicidal at the end of their reigns, partly because of the pressure and the schedule, but partly because of the the pressure to just be accessible to people all the time. I mean, I'm sure it's partly what any celebrity might feel who's in demand, but some some of the women specifically talk about the pressure of having to look good all the time and be available to people. So there, there was that. And then there are a few that have really distinctive stories that stand out. Um, Marilyn Vanderbur, who was a winner in the 50s, was sexually abused by her father as a child and wrote a book about this recovered memory that came to her of this long-term abuse after she was Miss America. And we talked about how being Miss America was almost an expression. She doesn't say like she became Miss America or competed because of this, but she says that she was successful at uh, presenting herself in a way that was useful in Miss America because she was so locked into her body and so in, in control of her body as a form of protecting herself that it, mm -hmm manifested in having this very upright posture and a very controlled sense of poise. So hers was a really moving and sad story. I mean, it has a happy ending in the sense that today she's in her 80s and she's an activist um, for people who, you know, for incest survivors. Mm -hmm. And so that's one very specific story. The other one that I really love is by Susan Supernaw, who was a uh, Muscogee Indian from Oklahoma who won in 1970. And she just overcame. She's a great example of somebody who, who used the pageant for her own purposes and really, uh, well, I guess going back to the question about the memoirs, her story is a real life narrative, which with lots of drama, it's not about you know, this is how I became beauty queen. It's about this is who I am and this is my history and this is why it mattered to me as a Native American. Uh, so it, it yeah. really had a different tenor from a lot of the other books I read. But they, they, I would say they're not, you know, at the bottom end of the spectrum. The, the least interesting are just talking about how they prepared. The most is interesting are the people talking about what happened after they won and what their lives became. Hmm. Yeah, what were the, I mean, you talk about it a bit in terms of a, a, a study about a bunch of contestants from one year, but but a thread of winners and their lives after. You know, you go into, that's the, what's great about the book is that you, you treat the people, you treat the winners like human beings and, you know, sort of explore their lives and, and you know, what they did both within mm -hmm. that time and, and part of afterwards. But, you know, when you were talking about the stress and the strain over that one year, I wondered how much of it also included the, when this year is over, who am I going to be? You know, is anyone going to know who I am after this? Um, yeah. There's one story from the, a winner in the twenties, one of the first, there was a, the, the pageant ran from 1921 to 1927. And then it took a break for a few years and came back in the thirties. And one of those early winners did a great interview with a movie magazine about this saying she won because she was pretty. And then after she won and was given a film contract and, and, it, and her film career never really took off, she 
ended up working on a studio set as I think as a receptionist and said, I didn't do anything to deserve this. I was born pretty. And so her self-confidence was knocked because after she won, she thought she, she just suffered from self-doubt. And, but the great thing about this interview was that she said she had, uh, you know, she, she had abandoned any aspiration of, of having a film career and she was happy that she didn't really want to be somebody in the public eye. She didn't want to have to think about her weight all the time. She, she talked about how it's a, one of the earliest examples of references to eating disorders in pageantry that I encountered. She talked about how a lot of the women starved themselves and she just didn't want to do that. And she put on 20 pounds after she competed and she felt great. <laughs> so it's nice to, you know, to see her just uh, coming through the other side and not having any regret. Yeah. Is there someone you wish you'd gotten to interview? Uh, if, well, first, someone who uh, died before you started the process. And then, you know, is there somebody around who you wish you could uh, you could have gotten for the book? The one who died who I really wish I could have interviewed was Yolan Betbees sure. from 1951. And we talked about that she was just such a great character. Happily, her daughter, I interviewed her daughter, who she was very close to and who was really helpful to me and shared a lot of information, um, and including a really interesting family detail about the fact that uh, when Yolande Bette Bees and her husband wanted to have children, they couldn't. So uh, Bette Bees had an affair with an Italian actor and got pregnant. And that's how her daughter came to be, who who gave me this wonderful information and interview. So, so Bette Bees. And then as for living Miss Americas, uh, Vanessa Williams is the one I would most want to talk to because she was so historically important. And also sort of like the woman I was mentioning, who I, I didn't say her name, Faye Lamphere was her name, the one who talked about the weight and the dieting. Yeah. Um, she, uh, the, uh, sorry, I just totally lost my thought talking about, uh, uh Vanessa Williams, who thank you wanted you, to, yes. yeah. um, it just, she, she's one of the ones who, you know, she had this scandal for those who are listening, who might not know that she was, uh, became Miss America. And then during her rain year, it was revealed that someone had taken naked pictures of her and sold them to penthouse and she was dethroned. And so that was devastating to her, but she was a Miss America who was also a survivor and who is one of the, the best known, if not the best known living Miss Americas and became famous in spite of Miss America. Whereas many of the others who became famous became famous because of Miss America. And, you know, she's super talented. She's been nominated for Emmys and Grammys and uh, has just had a very long running successful career. So she would be someone, I mean, she has talked a lot and I did read her memoir. So I don't know that she would be able to say more than she's already said, but I would have just loved to meet her and, and be able um, to ask her a few questions. You'd have gotten something out of her. Yeah, I'm sure you would have found some, some interesting angle to, to talk about with her, especially with you know, the knowledge you'd put together about the, the history of this. It might have been interesting to run by her some of the things that people told me. For example, one woman I interviewed who competed the year after Vanessa Williams talked about um, – she did her master's thesis on Miss America uh, – probably maybe 10 years after she competed and she interviewed all the women she competed with. And a, a theme that emerged was that Vanessa Williams, you know, having won the previous year, uh, that, that her, um, that scandal uh, overshadowed the following years, Miss America. And a number of the women who competed that year wondered if they lost because of what happened with Vanessa Williams, meaning one thought she had that her talent was too sexy and they were not going to take the chance of picking somebody who was sexy the year after the Vanessa Williams scandal. Um, others talked about how they really suffered when they lost, uh, that some of them felt they had disappointed their families. They, after the pageant, had, uh, you know, some some real lingering 
damage to their self images because they lost. So, uh, you know, of all the people who competed, Vanessa Williams would most likely have a lot to say about those types of things. I'm sure. Yeah. How surprised were you by the racist aspects of, of the pageant? The fact that black people were literally barred from black women were literally barred from competing until 1970. Yeah, well, actually, they were barred. They, there was this notorious rule number seven that was instituted in the 40s, and then it was retired in the 50s uh, that said you had to be in health, in good health and of the white race. Yeah. And so <laughs> Lenora Slaughter defended that by saying, well, you know, that's really just because we don't know how to judge this kind of beauty, meaning black beauty. So that's town amount to saying it, it, we don't see it. It doesn't register on us. So we're, right. we're, we're just not going to mess with that. And so then black women started competing uh, in the late sixties and they, it was a very small percentage of the overall contestants. And then the first state winner won in 1970 and then Vanessa Williams won the whole pageant in 1983. And since then, I think there have been a total of nine black winners. So they, you know, that that was redressed after Vanessa Williams. But the the racism isn't just specific to black women. The problem no. with the lack of Hispanic winners um, continues. And then one woman who competed in 2005 a uh, Latina from New Mexico, Anne Romero, told me that she had a overtly racist, racist experience when she competed because she and another woman were the only two Latinas and they were put in the same room, the same hotel room, and they were directed to the Spanish media. Uh, <laughs> that Neither of them spoke very good Spanish, but it was assumed that, that, that Spanish language media was for them. And, and then she talked, too, about how she, when she was uh, being interviewed, that the person interviewing her, who was a former state winner, asked her all these racist questions about um, illegal babies and illegal immigration. And the clear presumption was that she was, that she and Romero herself had come here illegally. And it was just incredibly offensive. And she realized, I have a platform that I'm promoting on suicide prevention, and I'm not even going to be able to talk about this because this interviewer is fixated on the subject of immigration. So that's that good to see that as a country, we've moved past that. that that's I'm just kidding. Yeah, it, it is. It's shocking. And, and so yeah. it's not, it's not just the, the pageant. It's also the nation. So for example, yeah. when Nina Davaluri won, um, four or five years ago, I forget what her year was, um, she was the first South Asian winner. She was targeted with just horrendous yeah. bigoted reaction. People didn't believe that this woman who grew up in New Jersey could be Miss America or could represent America. And so it goes both ways. There's There was racism within the pageant and then the pageant serves sort of like with Vanessa Williams, because there is a lot of hatred spewed at her. Um, even apart from the, the scandal with the photos, the fact that she was the first Black Miss America, some people simply were not ready to accept. Yeah. And it was surprising to see that that went on with Nina Davaluri. Yeah. Have you received any pre-response? I know the book comes out in a couple of days, but um, from people who are either pageant connected or pageant maniacs who've been reading uh, review copies. Has there been any uh, response? One you know, side or the they're other? just getting it. They've just been, I've, okay. I sent out to all the people I interviewed, I guess earlier this week, a note saying um, we're going to send you copies. So they, they ha I don't think they've gotten them yet. Hmm. But I'm but pretty sure they'll I, they were very <laughs> sweet about, you know, con congratulations and being excited to read it. I think they I think they see, as many advanced reviews have noted, that um, there's balance in this book, that my goal wasn't to tear down Miss America, which nobody really needs. I mean, that kind of yeah. happened in 1968 in terms of uh, calling out the sexism of this. I think that people understand that this is more about understanding what it meant historically 
and how that relates to where we are at this historical moment and what the women's individual stories have been in the context of that history. Yeah, I thought it was fascinating for something I don't have an inherent interest in. Like, I'm not the guy who's like, oh, my God, I've got to read a book about Miss America. But grab me from beginning to end and taught me a great deal. Uh, Oh, fabulous. I might be impressed. Yeah. I'm glad to hear that. There's a, a, a there have been a couple people I've spoken to in interviews who said if you told me I would be reading a book about Miss America two months ago, I I wouldn't have believed it, but <laughs> it pulled <laughs> me in. So that was nice. Now the the one thing, two things. First, usually with guests, we talk about things other than their book. But your book's fascinating, so we we spent a full hour discussing it. Uh, so I want to talk to you again sometime about your writing life, background, and 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 that whole shebang. If you're up oh, for sure. it, sure. Love to. Maybe when we're we're in the the post pandemic time when you and I can actually sit in a room and and I can have a conversation that way. But the yeah. one thing I did want to ask about the threads of your your past work into this one, um, the two previous books of yours I have both involve women and tattoos. So th- the fact that Miss America finally had a tattooed contestant a few years ago was was that the hook for you that oh thank God I can actually write this book and, and feel. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, but they, they're they related in more ways than you would think. They're yeah. both subcultures, female subcultures, uh, you know, directly inverted. Miss America is all about gender conformity. Tattooed women's history is all about nonconformity and not doing the expected. And both both books, I mean, two of my previous books are about tattoos, but I'm talking about bodies of subversion, which is yeah. – uh, the, the history of women's tattooing and tattoo culture going back also actually over a hundred years. And so, but, and, and both of them are narrative driven. I, I, I wanted the women's stories to drive the book and, uh, and, you know, offer uh, entree into the history. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I've had both of those, that and uh, uh, the blue tattoo on my shelf for a while. Didn't have a chance to get to them, but now that we've had this conversation, I can I can plunge into those and we could sit down again. That'd be great. I hope, I hope face-to-face <laughs> someday that, would, that it will be feasible. <laughs> yeah, that would be really nice. We'll have a drink or a coffee and, uh, and have another chat. Sounds wonderful. Margo, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, I, I really love your show. And I'm also looking forward to hearing from Kurt Anderson. Oh, that, that'll be a fun one. I hope, you know, um, it's interesting to me that his book is also about weird declining trends in America, except it's America itself, not just the Miss America, uh, contest. So, you know, I'm wondering how much of this conversation is going to carry over to tomorrow afternoons with him. Oh, I can't wait to hear that. You'll have to tune in and find out. I most certainly will. And that was Margot Mifflin. Her brand new book is Looking for Miss America, a pageant's 100-year quest to define womanhood from Counterpoint. Like I said, she took a subject I didn't have an inherent interest in and made a fascinating, compelling book out of it. I can't recommend it highly enough for one of those things that, wow, I did not think this was going to be the book that grabbed me, but it's going to grab you. Now, you should check out her site, margomifflin.com, for more on this one and her previous books, as well as articles she's written and events on her, her virtual book tour, which starts on Thursday, August 6th. And that's M-A-R-G-O-T-M-I-F-F-L-I-N.com. Margot's also on Facebook as Margot.Mifflin, on Twitter as M.S. Mifflin, all one word, and Instagram as M. Mifflin. I know they're all different. There'll be links to all of this stuff in the show notes for this episode. Now, in the before time, this is when I would mention my Patreon and PayPal and financial support and blah, blah, blah. But I don't need your financial support. I don't want your financial support. Your emotional support, um, you know, emails, letters, postcards, that sort of thing I appreciate. But my job is secure. The podcast costs me less than it ever did because of the lack of travel and, and you know, tolls, parking, etc. So um, if you do have money to spare, then 
go find the Kickstarters, Patreons, Indiegogos, uh, GoFundMes, tip jars, whatever, for the artists, creative people, or non-creative people uh, who are in need. If you're not comfortable giving to individuals, then go find some of the institutions and foundations and nonprofits that could use help right now. There are plenty of food banks and freedom funds that are, um, well, that are in dire need. So if you can help people and you've got a little bit to spare, then please give them a hand. Now, uh, as I always mention, I still have some copies left of the first issue of my very first zine, Haiku for Business Travelers. Um, if you want one of those, just drop me a line. It's free. Um, you can send me an email. You can go to haikuforbusinesstravelers.com and write me through there. Um, if you want to kick in a few bucks for postage and production, you can do that. There's a PayPal link for it, but this is not a money-making thing. It's just me sharing my art such as it is. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth, used with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memories Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. Now you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. <laughs>